Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to call the Economic Development and Housing Committee Community Reinvestment Area Public Hearing to order. Um, I am Council Member Shayla D. Favor, Chair of the Economic Development Committee. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. It's a beautiful, bright, sunny day. And so I just appreciate you all spending your time with us in Council Chambers. Um, I would like to introduce our uh, speakers that will provide us with some uh, testimony uh, today as it relates to this subject matter. Uh, we have Director Steve Shoney, uh, who oversees the Department of Development, as well as Nick King, uh, who will join us um, momentarily. He is the Principal of Preferred Living, uh, and Jared Smith, the Chief Development Officer with Preferred Living. Thank you all for your knowledge and expertise in this area. Um, I will call upon each of you in just a brief moment. So as the City of Columbus, Department of Development, and City Council move through the implementation of the new process of implementing the new housing incentive policy, one of the proposed recommendations focuses on the creation of the new community uh, reinvestment areas, or otherwise known as CRAs. You'll probably hear that term used throughout the hearing today. The goal of community reinvestment areas is neighborhood revitalization and stabilization. The following criteria will be considered prior to the creation of a CRA. New abatement areas will conform to existing boundaries as determined through the analysis of census tract. New abatement areas will also be evaluated based upon six distress criteria used to category, categorize the area, which would include population growth, median household income growth, poverty rate, growth in medium, housing vacancy rate, more closure, excuse me, mortgage foreclosure rate, and also includes project metrics such as project size, financial viability, affordability, and consistency with the city's development policies. The purpose of this public hearing is to review the first project that will move forward under the new CRA system, thereby creating the Kinney and Henderson Community Reinvestment Area. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Director Shoney to explain the CRA process in further detail. Thank you, Council Member Favor, um, and thank you for hosting us today. I have some slides that I'll run through to help um, illustrate what we're talking about. Um, so um, thank you for outlining uh, where we stand in the process. Um, this is our, and I know it's hard to see on the screen, um, this is the current map of our community reinvestment areas around the city of Columbus. Um, this map is the result to be honest, not of a consistent policy, but a series of individual decisions that were made over time. Uh, one of the things that we determined through our incentive study was that we need to, needed to have more of a systematic approach to how we engage in um, deciding whether or not to offer abatement in an area. And then with our new classification system, be doing that in a way that allows us to gather data that we're confident in, that developers and the community can both understand and have they can have confidence in that data as well. So one of the things that we um, have done is when a developer has um, a project that they would like to seek abatement on, uh, we at the city um, hire an outside consultant to look at the data across the six metrics that you outlined earlier um, for an individual census tract so that we will have the boundaries of our abatement areas over time, we will evolve to a system hopefully that corresponds with our census tracts around the city so that we can look at neighborhoods um, in a more data-driven way uh, in trying to move forward. The process that we're using, the, as you outlined, this is the first project um, where we have gone through this. The process as it relates to approval by council is we ask, we bring the legislation to create the CRA to a first reading. Uh, in this case, we actually did that last year in December. Um, then we, between first reading and second reading, have a hearing, that would be today. Um, and then we will do, bring to council for consideration on second reading on Monday, the legislation to actually implement uh, and help us, give us permission to set up the CRA. 
Um, I'm not going to go through the individual distress criteria, uh, Council Member, because you've already listed them. What I will say, one of the things that we tried to look at as we um, put these measures together is have a balance between measures that are um, looking at where the area stands today as it compares to the rest of the city and measures that are looking at a rate of change. So there are two things you have to look at when you look at an area, is where does it stand today and how is it trending? Uh, as you look at these, um, at these statistics, you'll see um, three of them are um, looking at what's the rate of change and how is this area comparing on a rate of change basis to the rest of the city, and then three of them are static um, measures. So we've tried to balance that. Uh, balance those distress criteria. We did, as uh, I believe you outlined, divide um, our abatement areas into three different categories. Uh, one is the market ready category. That is, uh, currently we have the AC Humco, 5th by Northwest, and Short North uh, abatement areas that fall into that category. That category really is those um, neighborhoods that are outperforming the city as a whole across, um, across all of our criteria. Or is it all about all but one, excuse me. Um, in those areas, there is a higher level of development that must happen. There are higher requirements for the provision of mixed income housing that must be accommodated. And there is also a requirement to um, begin making payments to the schools prior to the expiration of the abatement. Um, on the slide, there are a number of other uh, criteria. All of this information is up on the Development Department's website. Uh, we have a section on the website dedicated to the abatement policy. Um, we're constantly updating it as we put this new program in place. So what I, I would encourage um, everybody who is interested in this program to check that frequently because we are trying to keep it updated with frequently asked questions and new guidelines and various things like that. Um, just to review, the other two categories are ready for revitalization. Um, in this category, the uh, these are abatement areas that are um, underperforming the city in two to four um, categories. In this area, the requirements for um, uh, the requirements for providing affordable housing or mixed income housing are slightly less stringent. Um, there is not the requirement to begin making payments to the schools because what we're trying to do is, uh, and the reason for the difference in those requirements is to make it more attractive on an abatement basis to invest in these communities because these communities are not doing well as well as our market ready neighborhoods. Uh, and then finally, our ready for opportunity neighborhoods are those that are underperforming the city in five or six of our categories. In those neighborhoods, we put very few restrictions on the abatement um, because we are actively trying to encourage um, the beginning of new investment into these neighborhoods. So we're more aggressive in those neighborhoods. So turning to um, this specific um, uh, census tract that we're looking at, um, the, which we're calling the Kenny and Henderson CRA, um, this covers uh, an area that is bordered, um, that primarily concentrates around the intersection of Kenny Road and Henderson Road. Uh, it's, as with all census tracts, um, a little bit of an odd shape, but it's the best shape. Uh, that it's the most logical uh, categorization of an area that we uh, could come up with. Um, the, the, in terms of the performance as it relates to um, the distress criteria, it outperformed the city baseline in all six distress, distress criteria. So it will be classified as a market ready area. Um, it will be a five story development, which is consistent with our um, requirements for the market ready areas. Uh, this helps us to encourage uh, what we believe is an appropriate level of density for the city moving forward as we um, try to move to a, a density level in the city that takes advantage of our existing infrastructure and allows for different types of mobility um, options in the future. Um, it is an area of high opportunity. It's well served by um, existing bus lines. Uh, it is an area where there is not an abundance of mixed income housing currently. So the ability to get 20% of these units that are affordable to middle income households uh, is an important objective of ours. And it's something that bringing this into this neighborhood at this time, uh, we think is very important. Um, and uh, 
that, it concludes my remarks. The only other slide I had was a little bit better view of uh, the area. Um, again, one thing to emphasize is this CRA will not just cover this project, but will cover this entire um, area. With that, I'll conclude my remarks and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director Shoney. Um, at this time, would Nick King please approach the podium? Thank you. And although I've provided just a brief introduction, if you could as well Absolutely. give a little bit Good additional afternoon. information. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jared told me I only have 60 seconds, so I'll be brief, and you guys will probably be glad when I'm done. But You uh, have longer than that. <laughs> my, my name is Nick King, uh, owner and founder of Preferred Living, uh, which began in 1996. Uh, I personally grew up uh, in this area and have uh, lived, uh, gone to school and office in this area for uh, almost 35 years. And this area has been very important to us uh, throughout our career of Preferred Living. We've developed or redeveloped 16 different properties in Northwest Columbus. Um, six of those properties are within uh, less than a half a mile of the new CRA that, uh, we're, that's looking to be formed. Um, so this area is very important to us. And we see this as an opportunity to remove a significant amount of blight and to really change uh, the feel and the opportunity uh, with affordable housing. Um, so I, I know Steve presented a bunch of data and all the reasons why it's important and uh, he can tell you better than obviously than I can and, and Jared can and further that uh, point but uh, we have spent a lot of time in this area it's very important to us and we're very excited uh, to see this area uh, be cleaned up of the blight and offer some affordability that uh, that is there right now thank you mr. King thank I'm you. sure there'll be some questions for you later okay. on uh, Jared Smith if you could join us at the podium Thank you, as Nick mentioned, and uh, you mentioned my name is Jared Smith with Preferred Living. I'm the Chief Development Officer, and I think what already hasn't been covered is the idea that, uh, you know, with this project, within the CRA specifically, is a, you know, the kind of groundbreaking of this project is a new 220-unit development, of which of those, obviously, we believe we are uh, eliminating significant blight and adding uh, 40 new attainable units in the area, and I think uh, while Everyone gets really excited about living downtown and the affordability of downtown, the cost of living even in the suburbs. And, you know, as you kind of go in concentric rings outside of downtown, that price has increased incrementally as well. So adding those 40 new units while doing some cleanup in the area will be significantly better. So that's all I have. And do you have any images of the proposed project? I did, I did bring a couple boards. I'm happy to show them to you. Absolutely. All right, at this time, we will move forward with public testimony. I believe we have four um, speaker slips, uh, individuals who are interested in um, addressing um, this topic today uh, did need to uh, submit a speaker slip by 4 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. As I call your name, please approach the podium. Um, you will have three minutes to provide your testimony. Uh, there will be a a nice clock that will show up in a, a slight ding to inform you of when your time is up. Um, so I will call you uh, in order of receipt. I have Miss Joyce Jacobson. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I live, I have been living in that, in this area, in the area of, whoops, here we go, better? Okay. I have lived in the, uh, in this, 
uh, CRA area since 1976. Um, I have, uh, I rented, I owned a property um, and then I sold it because the taxes got too high in Arlington. And uh, I rented a property in this area for 14 years and the owner decided to sell it and an investor from California who was buying up properties in Ohio uh, purchased it and doubled my rent. I'm a senior and so I had to leave in 30 days and I have no family here so it was very, very stressful. Um, I had only been able to find one place that I could afford still in this area <clears throat> And that is not working out well because the, um, anyway, the manager is, um, wasn't making repairs and he was in jail last night. And so um, I know that preferred living, their bottom line in my understanding from a, a Northwest Civic Association meeting, um, their, and their affordability is $1,000 for a one bedroom. Um, and that is, not my affordability. Uh, it would not be the affordability of the neighbors that I had who are still living there uh, in that, on that street. Um, so, I, so it's very important to me. I wonder that when you, when you did your, your study or research on the income, did you um, include uh, or how did you include those of us who are on fixed incomes and um, uh, because we are not earning money. So I, I don't know how that fit into that, um, to that study. I think the density uh, preferred living from my observations is that um, they're very dense uh, when they go into an area. They're often a lot of, uh, more than, than I think, well, certainly that I do and many other residents think uh, is um, um, wise for the traffic. And, um, and I personally have an objection to why are they so upscale that does not uh, address my needs and many of my peers' needs uh, for that area. And that, I think, is, is pretty much it. If I may just, um, you made a comment about the project being upscale, if you could elaborate just a bit. Well, I looked at the, um, at the Northwest Civic Association meeting, they brought the, um, their show, you know, their marketing, uh, and uh, it's very, uh, it's quite upscale for the area. It does not look like the rest of the area at all. And um, so it's like, I understand that putting something like that might increase the property values around, but that's not what we need uh, to have a, a mixed uh, affordable area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Shoney, if you could speak to um, how we get to uh, the affordability. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Favor. Um, the so in the um, affordable housing world, typically rents are gauged against what's called uh, area median income, which is the median income for the metropolitan statistical area of central Ohio. Um, that essentially looks at and set and the standard standard by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and it's been this way for decades is that a household should not spend more than 30% of its income on um, rent plus basic utilities. So what we have done is we've used the Department of Housing and Urban Development standard that for the Columbus region to say these household, the rent needs to be not more than 30% of, 10% of the units need to be affordable to households making not more than 80% of the area median income and another 10% need to be affordable to households not making more than 100% of the median income. So um, there, one of the challenges we faced in, in doing the incentive study is um, at the end of the day, the abatement is only worth so much. And um, we looked at whether we could 
try and push the level of affordability that we were going to require down to 60% of area med median income. And <clears throat> as we looked at the data, we just didn't think that was practical. We didn't think there was enough value in the abatement. Uh, when you looked at the cost of construction um, in the Columbus market that we would actually be able to get any affordable units. One of the challenges we've seen, we've seen nationally is where communities try and push that affordability too low, they actually have the opposite impact, where it tends to stifle the creation of new housing units. And if you um, reduce the supply in an area when demand is going up and demand for housing is always going up in Columbus, uh, prices rise faster. Thank you. And as it relates to traffic, uh, when we have projects like this that are on the horizon, can you explain for the viewing audience the traffic studies that are, will be at play? Uh, thank you for the question. And um, I'm not entirely sure what level of traffic study this project was required to go through. I might ask um, Nick or Jared to come up and talk about that. Uh, but whenever there are projects of this scale, uh, the Department of Public Service does look at the, pro at the project to see if it will have a material impact on, um, on traffic patterns in the area. I will tell you there have been proposals for other abatement areas uh, where we have said no to doing the abatement because uh, we were concerned about whether or not the road network could handle um, multiple projects on land that was there and immediately developed. So we have looked at that as an issue when we um, think about putting abatement areas in. Uh, this is, it's something we looked at in this area. Traffic, um, there are traffic pressures in this area, particularly at 315 and Henderson. Um, but we feel after talking to our uh, colleagues at public service that this project is appropriate for the area. Um, Nick or Jared, I don't know if you guys want to come up and speak to um, the degree of traffic analysis that was done on this. I think obviously just to clarify, with any zoning, there is an individual traffic study for each project. And I think just to focus on the project that we're discussing within the CRA itself, a traffic study was completed and approved by the city. Um, with this project in particular, uh, what we found obviously that helps in this particular circumstance is there is a traffic light at Old Henderson that does control some of that in and out. And given the fact that Old Henderson is a dead end, so that it's really only kind of coming from a right in, right out, and a continuous right turn. Um, so uh, obviously, I can, Director Shoney can speak to it more, but if there are additional projects within this CRA in and of itself, and it is a relatively small CRA now that we've gone to a, I call it kind of a pocket census track, um, each new project, depending on the size and scale, obviously will need its own traffic access or impact study. So, Thank you. Mr. Joel Motil. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Councilwoman Favor, uh, Director Hart uh, Shoney. Uh, my name is Joe Motil. I reside at 167 West Cook Road, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, just a few comments, and I'm not going to take three minutes, but the community uh, reinvestment area, or CRA, that uh, were established for geographical areas within a city, village, or county, in which investment and in housing has traditionally been discouraged. And I think these areas also need to be distressed to qualify, as was stated, for tax abatements. I've lived less than a mile from this proposed CRA for the last 13 years, and I've lived in this general area for most of my life. And this is by any stretch of the imagination a distressed area and one that requires a tax abatement to help out yet another friendly campaign contributor, that, uh, developer of our elected officials. It's a stone's throw away from Upper Arlington, which is one of the wealthiest suburbs of Columbus with a median income of $103,000 and a median property value of $338,000. And I can't really believe you're even considering this. I think it's especially uh, to help a developer who is considering to displace about 80 families that live in a 55 and over trailer community in my Clintonville neighborhood just a few miles east to this proposed CRA so he can build a new apartment complex. So my question really, you know, is when is this nonsense ever going to stop? 
It's like everybody has caught the Jeff Bezos fever. In case you haven't heard, the taxpayers are tired of subsidizing the rich, whether it's corporations or developers. And I'm not only am I against this CRA, but it's long overdue that you discontinue the CRA designations of the Short North, AC Humco, and Fifth by Northwest. And I would certainly also um, question the uh, applicant here who states that these areas are blighted, significantly blighted. Uh, I don't know where he's talking about. If he wants to see some blighted neighborhoods that are in need of help, drive through the south side or the hilltop or the Linden areas. But uh, this is hardly a significantly blighted area in need of a tax abatement. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Director Shoney. Um, thank you, Chair Faber. Uh, to the question of, um, I, I guess I'll just say, we have met the, we've done a blight study of the area. We have found blight that meets the state standard. Uh, and so we're confident that this is appropriate use of this tool under the state law. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. King or Mr. Smith, is there anything additional you'd like to add at this time? Okay. Uh, Director Shoney, I hate to put you on the spot here, but if you could speak to the, um, the call for affordable housing outside of uh, our main corridors uh, that we, we talk a lot about um, at, throughout the city, so like a Linden or a Hilltop. Um, thank you, Council Member. It, there are a couple of things that we've learned. Um, number one, and, and I think it applies to um, this situation as well as the situations in Linden and the Hilltop, is when you have the opportunity to get some affordability into a neighborhood, take it. Um, in the, that's one of the lessons that I would say we've learned from the experience in the short north is we didn't do enough to preserve affordability early on. So in this case, um, it is a neighborhood, the, stat, the, the statistics show, it is a neighborhood that is doing better than uh, the city as a whole. And that's all the more reason that we need to, when we have the opportunity to preserve some affordability in a neighborhood or build some affordability in a neighborhood, we need to take it. Um, similarly, when we're looking at opportunities like we've had recently um, with proposals for uh, high quality affordable housing along Cleveland Avenue in Linden. Um, as we're looking to spur reinvestment in Linden, we need to start with affordability so that we're locking that in for the long term. Um, that's why we're really excited about working on uh, the community land trust because it's another way to lock in that affordability for the long term. Uh, because you know, if you don't learn from your past experiences, you're going to repeat your past mistakes. and so. Uh, we, I think, learned that experience um, on the negative to some degree in the short north to the positive, frankly, in Wyland Park, where there has been, there was an existing base of affordable housing. Um, you're seeing uh, there's a lot of focus on what's being developed new there that's higher income, right next to a very strong base of affordable housing. And I know that we, the presentation kind of uh, moved quickly through the conversation of the actual abatement and the money that will eventually go to the schools. Can you discuss that? Yeah, so starting in, thank you for the question. Um, starting in year 11, um, we have a, um, Hannah's trying to point at something, I don't have my glasses on. Um, she's writing it bigger for me, thank you, just to make sure I have the statistic right. Um, starting in year 11, uh, the developers required to pay 15% of the taxes they would have otherwise paid to the schools uh, in year 12, that goes to 30%. In year 13, that goes to 45, 60, 75, and then the abatement con uh, concludes. That's different than, we do, than we've ever done in the past. That's a new provision. Um, and that's something that we require in these areas that are doing better because the economics support it. Thank you for that explanation. Uh, Mr. Shane Hart. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Shane Hart, I pastor Capital City Church at 1290 Old Henderson Road. It's actually within the CRA that we are talking about. Uh, our church has been in this area since 1990. Uh, we've been in our current location since 2002, and I have been there for the last 10 years, since 2008. Uh, over those 10 years, I have seen a, a lot happen in that community. 
and uh, specifically the blight that, that has been mentioned many times, uh, the specific project that Preferred Living is, is talking about, that area on the east side of Kenny along Old Henderson, when you go back in there, I would definitely call that a blight. Um, it does not compare maybe to some other portions of the city, but it definitely is a blight for that area. And those buildings are only getting worse by the day. I've watched them over the last 10 years as they are uh, definitely not improving in any way. Uh, as well as the rest of the CRA, as I look at that, there are a number of buildings along, um, uh, as you go up North Kenny, uh, north of Henderson Road, there's a number of buildings, warehouses, uh, old buildings that are falling apart, uh, properties that are not being very well maintained. Um, they are not going to get better without some, uh, some aggressive move, without a strategy, without a plan. Uh, as far as for preferred living, they are great neighbors. Uh, we have seen uh, multiple ways that they have improved that area along Northwest Columbus. There are uh, multiple examples, Berkeley House, uh, Taylor House, that you can look at where they've improved the area. And not only them, you start seeing other businesses around the area start to improve when they move in. Uh, because now all of a sudden there's more clientele. Uh, it uh, raises the look of things within their architecture. Um, they are building a slightly higher end apartments than some of the others that are there. I love to hear that there's uh, affordability being preserved within these higher end apartments as well. We also know that uh, that area of Columbus is fastly growing in a younger demographic. And the younger demographic is looking for the amenities that preferred living and others that will probably take advantage of the CRA will be able to provide. So I absolutely am in, in favor of this. As a member of that community, as a pastor in that area, um, we, uh, we support these kinds of things because it's just going to raise the whole level of that community and the whole level of the citizens there, provide more opportunities for them, uh, as well as provide more amenities for those that live within that area. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And lastly, we have Mr. John McDermott. And I had no idea there was a parking garage available. Okay. So that's beside the point. Okay. I'm ready to begin the time whenever. You're, you're free to go whenever. Okay. So. Firstly, you know, there's been some very interesting comments mentioned this afternoon. And um, to, to mention something about what uh, Development Director Mr. Steve Shoney mentioned, I believe that's okay, um, about supply. Um, you know, everybody has heard supply and demand. And I used to live in that area in 2017 and 2018. And uh, I mean, you could probably follow an exponential curve and see that, 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 that rent there is probably increasing a lot faster than other areas, uh, much faster than the south side. So that's beside my point. So I believe I submitted some uh, Google Earth pictures. I drew little yellow lines and little red lines. The yellow lines are to address um, potential new multi-use pathways. Um, the only issue is there that, uh, of course, a portion of that area, which I think was mentioned already, Old Henderson Dead Ends, into a little train station, a little toy train station place, um, where you can do meetings and things like that. Um, but I'm sure they picked that spot because it is actually adjacent to active railroad tracks, something that I think about 15 years ago, Michael Coleman brought to the voters and tried to get high-speed rail around that area uh, using some portion of those tracks. And it, and it failed um, for whatever reason. So those yellow lines cross Old Henderson, or travel down Old Henderson. They would cross active railroad tracks, which is obvious problem, and would continue further on down the road um, to well-marked signed areas that say bike path, travel this way basically through the neighborhood, you know, very calm residential area. But you know, in that area in Columbus, there's cul-de-sacs and stuff like that. So to make that connection, I think is important. And on that north drawing, um, that yellow line is adjacent to medium voltage um, 
not transmission lines, you know, medium voltage above, you know, you know, to distribute power to the area and whereabouts hit transformers and, and what have you. So getting to my point, um, to buy up that property, I think in the north and south portions, um, it could really increase bikeability, walkability, multi-use trails, and uh, create a circle around that area, hit that 315 um, pedestrian bridge that goes over 315, and connect that area, which is ripe for great, you know, a, a high-rise development type stuff, finishing my point, and hit the Old Tangy Trail north-south, east-west connection, north-south, and it's, I think it'd be worth the money. Thank you for your comments, sir. Oh, sir, I believe you left your jacket. Uh, Director Shoney, do you know if there are any uh, plans to um, uh, create any type of additional trailways, pathways? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do not know off the top of my head whether there are um, opportunities. I do know, um, frankly, from using the trail network in this area myself, um, that it is a relatively speaking easy um, area, but I'm sure there are opportunities for improvement. Um, I can uh, put the folks from Preferred in touch with Brad Westfall, at, who, who is with the Department of Recreation and Parks, and see what we have in terms of trail networks and how they could connect not only through the city, but also through the trail networks in Arlington as well. Okay, and it didn't come up, uh, but if we could talk about uh, just transportation in general uh, in that area, um, is Coda present? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Coda is present in the area. There are lines uh, on, I believe, on both Kenny and Henderson, as well as um, lines running up and down Olentangy. Um, and it is an area um, that we are looking at in terms of the Olentangy River Road corridor um, as we look at what comes next for transit and mobility in the city. Um, that corridor is an important one for us. Uh, it serves a tremendous amount of neighborhoods as well as a lot of our um, employers in the city. So uh, it is an area that we're studying very closely. Excuse me. And lastly, uh, if we can just zero in on our conversation once again why we're ac actually here. We're not here to discuss the actual zoning of the project just the creation of the CRA, which would be the Kinney and Henderson CRA. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for making that point. That is correct. Um, the, zoning pro the zoning goes through a separate process um, that is independent. It runs through uh, Zoning Chair Tyson uh, and uh, her committees so that the community has the opportunity to have input through that process as well. This is simply a process about setting up this community reinvestment area. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our public testimony and today's hearing. Um, if there are any remaining questions, comments, or concerns, uh, please feel free to reach out to our office as well as the Department of Development uh, with any of those questions. We will be happy to connect you um, and try to provide any answers that uh, you may have at this time. Uh, thank you and have a good evening.